just a fair warning. Okay, we're in our Tough Topic series. Uh, and what we're doing, again, if you're just visiting, if you're kind of new here, you've been gone for a few weeks, we're, we're working through some really, really difficult topics uh, that we run into uh, in society, that, that, we, we, that we face sometimes. And what we're trying to do is give a good biblical answer or account of whatever that tough topic is. And we've covered some. We've, we've talked about um, abortion and the sanctity of life. We've talked about how the enemy uh, works in, uh, in this world and, and named a whole bunch of ways. Um, but for the next two weeks, we're going to look at the topic of mental health. And I'm just warning you, it's going to be a little bit heavy, okay, this week and next week. Now, as I was planning this week, and, 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 and I don't have a flashy title because, and you can go ahead and put that out, it's just Tough Topics, Mental Health, Mental Health Part 1. As I was studying this week, I had so much material, and often what I'll do if I want to cram it all into one week, I'll weed out some of that. I didn't want to cut anything from it because I don't want to skimp on anything or shortchange any area. So we're going to break this up into two weeks. Um, again, fair warning, more of the bells and whistles and the interesting stuff and the stories and that are next week. Sorry. So today is just, it's going to be a little bit heavy, but we need to talk about this. And, and this week as I was searching for a topic, now when I'm preparing for a message, I love to, to do series because series, they, they flow. And when I go to prepare for that week, I have something to build off of. And, and as far as my, my preparation time, it comes much easier. Uh, but when you do standalone messages, it takes a lot more time and just mental capacity and effort. And this Tough Topic series, it really is a bunch of standalone messages. So Early on in the week, or basically Sunday, about when I hit the bottom step right there, my mind starts going to next week, because welcome to my life, and I, I start praying, okay, God, where do you want us to go for next week? And I have a handful of topics that I want to cover, and I want to kind of dip and dive through some of the harder ones and some of the easier ones, and as I was researching, as I was praying through it, as I was thinking through it, I was looking at things, God brought me to mental health. Now, I just want to be super honest and transparent with you guys. When I first thought, really, God, mental health, I have no authority to talk about that subject. And I wrestled with God a little bit, and here's why. And, and I don't say this braggingly, I'm just giving you the facts. I don't struggle with mental health whatsoever. I am like, and if you guys know me, I am like Mr. Happy-Go-Lucky, Mr. Glasses Always Half-Full, like, oh, we got problems? Oh, okay, no problem. We'll, we'll just deal with it. That's just me. So I was really struggling going, God, what am I going to say about mental health? Why would I stand in front of a couple of hundred people and an online audience, welcome to everybody at home, and an online audience, and have any authority to talk about mental health and mental illness. And the more I kind of dug into it, the more I did research, God kind of gave me two reasons. The first reason is because we need to hear it. Because it is so prevalent in our society. And because I feel like God wants me to preach his word and, and bring you something that you're going to take home and you're going to be able to use. So if you're struggling with mental health or, or any kind of depressive anxiety, and we're going to cover the whole list here in just a minute, any of those issues, I'm so glad you're here. But the second reason why I really felt God speaking to me saying, yes, you need to talk about this, is for those of us who don't struggle with it. Because I think it's just as important for us to understand how big of a deal this is. Because what we'll do is we will come to a place and we will see somebody struggling with, we'll just, we'll pick on depression for a minute. We'll see somebody struggling with depression or anxiety and we'll be like, just think happy thoughts, right? Just, just you know, it, it's going to be okay. And that's 
what we have a tendency to do sometimes. And again, we're going to talk next week about how we treat it in our churches, and it's not always good. And so that's why God just, just spoke to me and said, no, 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 we need to talk about this. It's a tough topic. It's going to hurt. And, and I get it. As we're walking through all of these tough topics, I, I, I know it's not just topics. It could be trauma for you. This could well up some kind of pain and hurt inside of you, and I get it. And please understand, I want to I wanna be up here, and I want to come from an attitude of grace and love and acceptance and mercy. You know why? Because that's what God gave me. And so that's here at ICC, that's what we want to be. We want to be a church of love and grace and mercy and acceptance. Amen? All right, so Isaiah 26.3. This is going to be our key verse for this week and, and next week. Isaiah 26.3. It says this, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now, this is, as I studied more on this verse, as I kind of ran through it in my head, I could probably preach the entire message just on this verse. This verse, and, and again, this is, when we read scripture, don't just read a big block and, and that's it, you got your check mark. Look at what it says. Just this one verse, I mean, is so chock full. It says, you keep him in perfect Peace. Now, I've said this a lot lately, things like peace, joy, comfort, those things that God promises that he can give us, like if I could take those things and bottle them up and sell it, wow, like people would pay, people would give everything that they have for peace. Some people would give every single penny that they own for joy in their lives. And here is just one of many verses, and it says, you keep him in perfect peace. And, and I was looking at that, I was going, okay, perfect peace, great. And then as I thought about it more, I'm like, okay, what in the world is perfect peace? What, what, what does Isaiah mean when he's talking about God and he says, God, you're going to keep people in perfect peace. So I've taught you this before. One of the really good things to do when you're reading scripture and you want to know what it really means, what the original author really meant, you just Google Isaiah 26.3 lexicon, L-E-X-I-C-O-N. Okay, and that will take you back to either the Hebrew, which Old Testament Hebrew, or the Greek and you can kind of dig in to see what that means, that perfect peace. So I looked it up. I did that as I do quite often. And we know the word peace, right? What's, what's the, uh, the Hebrew word for peace? Shalom. See, most of us know this. Shalom. It just means peace. It's, it's a bit of a greeting, right? Like, like you, you, you say to somebody, shalom. If you were walking through the store and, and you see a Jewish person, you could say to them, Shalom, and they would probably say back to you, Shalom, it's, it's a greeting, it's a, it's a term of respect. Hey, I want, I want to give peace to you. It's almost a speaking of blessing. Peace, have peace. Now, so when I looked it up, okay, peace, Shalom, okay, that's exactly what I expected. So I looked at this word perfect. What is the Hebrew word for perfect that they're using here? It is Shalom. I'm like, wait a minute, we, there, something's wrong here. You keep him in shalom, shalom, peace, peace. That doesn't really translate to our English, does it? So I was like, is this a mistake? Is this so I looked more, I clicked on it, I did a little bit of digging, and it's not wrong. You keep him in peace, peace. So when we really look at the definition of this word peace, it means this, completeness, soundness, welfare, or peace. Completeness, soundness, welfare, or peace. So then we could take that, you keep him in complete peace. You keep him in sound peace. You keep him in peace that brings welfare. Or you could just say, you keep him in peace, peace. And when we say that now, that makes a little bit more sense, doesn't it? 
That's the kind of peace that God wants to give us. But there's a condition. It just doesn't say that. It, it doesn't say, you keep him in perfect peace, period, next verse. There's a little bit of a condition there, isn't it? It says, you keep him in perfect peace whose, here's the condition, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Whose mind, what does that mean for your mind to be stayed on God? It means fixed, attached. It means you abide in Christ or you remain in Christ, John 15, 1 through 17. Whose mind is stayed on you, whose mind where we can have perfect peace if our mind is completely fixed on the Lord. Because, and then it, it does that thing, it kind of backs up and it says it again, because he trusts in you. Now again, this is really big. This is one of those little phrases where we would just read it and say, oh yeah, we're supposed to trust in God. But let's take this a little deeper. If you really are fully trusting in God, who or what are you not trusting in? Go ahead. Yourself. I heard it. Government. Uh, what else? Money. Circumstances. Your status. Your zeros in your bank account. All of those things you're not trusting in if you are trusting in God. So wow, one little verse makes so much meaning for something like it's the key. It's like we've opened up this treasure chest to this, this thing called peace that we would all say that we wanted. And, and much less perfect peace we can have perfect peace. God will give us perfect peace if we keep our mind, our, our lives attached, stayed, fixated on the Lord and trust only in him. Brings a little bit more meaning to that verse, doesn't it? Isaiah 26.3, we should really, really just memorize that verse. So now mental health. This is a really, really, really big topic. Here's a, here's a definition, and this is from the CDC. Mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. It also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others, and make healthy choices. That's pretty exhaustive, isn't it? Now, if we look at that definition, and again, that's right from the CDC's website. If we look at that definition, it's obvious that our mental health and our mental wellness affects every single area of our lives. Every area, the good, the bad, and the ugly, our mental health runs those areas of our lives. So that's the definition. Let's look at some of the diagnosis or some of the, the terms or the labels that we have here. It could be depression, anxiety, eating disorders, bipolar disorder, PTSD, postpartum, addiction, anger, OCD, schizophrenia, and other personality disorders, Disassociative disorders, sexual and gender disorders, tick disorders, and somatic symptom disorders, just to name a few. That's a lot. There is a lot going on in this world. And again, if we realize that our mental health and wellness affects every single area of our lives, I think we really need to take a deep look at this and see it a little more serious. Now, I want to say this. As I just read through that huge list, and if you do or have struggled with your mental health, I need you to know you are not your diagnosis. You are not that label. That is something that you struggle with, and we're going to talk through this next two weeks about how God wants us to work through that, but that is not you. That is 
something that you have that we can deal with. What are you? You are a child of God who is loved, who is accepted just as you are, and that God wants to deliver you no matter, regardless of your condition. I also want to say this, and I, I want to be very, very cautious in how I say this, because I have seen this, and it's becoming more and more prevalent in our society. Don't let your diagnosis, that's not you, but don't let it willfully become your identity. And, and I've seen this, and it's very, very strange, but in some circles, your mental health or your struggle with it can almost become a positive thing, or, or that's kind of what you purposely attach all of life to. Don't do that because that's not how God says that you are. Face it, deal with it, get help for it, don't be ashamed of it, but don't let it be the lens through which you look at all of life. There is a much better lens to look at life, and that's Jesus, than whatever thing is you're struggling. So, Here's a question that hopefully I've answered already, but I really want to bring this to the forefront. And the question you might be asking is, why are we talking about this in a church service? Why are we talking about mental health here? I'm sure the Bible has some stuff to say about it, but like, shouldn't that be a thing that you talk about with your health care provider or a counselor? And that answer is yes, absolutely you should. But yes, absolutely we should look into God's word and see what God has to say about it. So I'll be honest, I wrestled with this question. This was one of the things I wrestled with when deciding, and God just says, you're going to talk about it anyway, so just give up, okay? And he does that sometimes. Um, I wrestled, like, really, in church, God? Like, that's where we're supposed to talk about it? But I want to give you three reasons, two this week, one next week, three reasons why we should be talking about mental health in church. If you're taking notes, you may want to write a couple of these things down. Uh, here's kind of a big one. Number one, it is a favorable tool of the enemy. It is a favorable tool of the enemy. I did not say it's always from the enemy, but I said it is a favorable tool of the enemy. Ephesians 6, 12. Ephesians 6, this is the armor of God passage. This was our battlefield series uh, passage. We keep referring back to this because we see the enemy working in our society, and here's one of the way he works. Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle, the things that we're dealing with in our life could be mental health. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And again, I want to back up and repeat myself. Not all mental illness is from the enemy. That's just not true. And, and I, know, I know a lot of people, they like to attribute everything to the enemy. Oh, the devil. Like, like they stub their toe. Oh, that was the devil. No, you cut the corner too close and you stubbed your toe. Okay, the devil doesn't really care about your toe. So don't automatically blame everything on the enemy. And, and church people, and we're going to get to this next week, church people, don't automatically tag everyone that you see with mental health issues as a spiritual battle. Don't do that. Don't do that. Now, here are some of the most common thoughts of someone struggling with mental illness. And in a room this size, I know that there are several in here who have said at least one, if not several of these things. And what I want to do today, kind of the, the sermon portion of today, is I just want to pick apart some of these things that someone that is just struggling with and see what God's response to these things would be. So the first one is, my life will never amount to anything. My life, 
I'll, I'll never amount to anything. One of the main reasons why people think that is because they were told that a lot. A lot of times in adolescence by a loved one, someone close to them, you'll never amount to anything. And you believed it. And it changed the way that it makes you feel. And again, we're really going to talk about that next week. But like you were, you were told, and now you believe my life will never amount to anything. Jeremiah 29, 11, iconic verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Which right there is awesome that God not only knows you, but he actually has plans for you. Like that's pretty cool. The creator and sustainer of, well, pretty much everything, right? Has a plan for you. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And if you're struggling with your mental health, man, hope just seems like a fairy tale. Hope just seems like something that you will never attain. But that's what God wants to give us. My life will never amount to anything. Here's another one. I have nothing to be thankful for. Like, my life is just a waste. I, there's, there's nothing in my life to be thankful for. And I understand, like, you may be down and out. You may not own pretty much hardly anything. I, I get that. We hit lows in our lives. But there is always something to be thankful for. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, another iconic verse. Give thanks in some circumstances, right? Is that what it says? Give thanks in most circumstances? Give thanks in the circumstances where you have something to be thankful for. Is that what it says? What's it say? All. Like the bad ones too? Yeah. That's, what, that's pretty much what all means, right? All means all. Give thanks in all circumstances. So, so, why? Why would I give thanks in all circumstances? Why would I give thanks to God now? Like, like it doesn't even feel like God's around. We're going to cover that one here in just a second. Because God can and will deliver you if you turn to him. Remember, he gives what kind of peace? Perfect peace to those whose mind is stayed on him, to those who trust in him. So he wants to give us that peace. We have so much to be thankful for. If we own nothing, we can give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I say this a lot. If I didn't get to take my next breath, I still have Jesus to be thankful for. There's a cross behind me that symbolizes what my Savior did for me, and if nothing else, that's enough. That is enough. I have nothing to be thankful for. Here's another one. I don't know if God's even there. I don't know if God's even there. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Maybe God's not real. Like, I don't feel him, so how can he be there? Like, he didn't rescue me out of this thing. I'm still going through it. How could there be a God? Psalm 23, 4, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I love how the King James says it, even though I walk through the what? The valley of the shadow of death. Now, that sounds like a pretty bad place, doesn't it? That sounds terrifying. But even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. How, David? How could you write this? You're walking through the darkest valley. You're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. How can you say you won't have any fear? Well, he answers his own question. For you are with me. But wait a minute, David. You're in the struggle. You're in the valley right now. It doesn't seem like God is with you because he's not rescuing me. And he's, no, 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 no. But he is still with me. God is always 
always there. Does God allow us to go through some things? Yes, absolutely. Do we get ourselves into some things sometimes? Yes. Did God probably send like 10 signals saying, don't do that, dummy, don't do that, dummy, and we still did it anyway, and then we found ourselves in the valley of the shadow of death? Uh Uh-huh. But God is still there going, turn towards me. I will rescue you. I will give you perfect peace. Deuteronomy 31, 6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. It was this massive army, like, like, like they had every reason to be afraid and terrified. For, there's one of those words, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you, nor turn his back on you. God is always, always there. Will he allow us to go through some things for the betterment of us so that we can learn and grow? Yes. For the betterment of some other people sometimes? Yes. Sometimes we won't even know why we went through those things? Yes. All of the above. But God is always, always there with us. Here's another. I'm always going to feel this way. I'm always going to feel it. There's, there's, there's no delivery in this. I am always going to feel this burden, this crippling burden. Isaiah 41.10, this is the verse that uh, Gabe read just a little bit ago. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. And that, that's such a big statement, don't have time to get into it. He's like, I'm your God, not these other gods, not these other little G gods that you see out here in the other nations. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Sorry, lefties. Just reading it as it is. Look at those promises in there from God that Isaiah is prophesying. He says, I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. That's pretty good, isn't it? Like that's four amazing promises. When you feel, I'm always going to feel this way. I'm never going to get out of this pit. Maybe God's allowing you to go through that pit. Maybe you got yourself into that pit. I'll say it over and over and over. But God is with you and he will deliver you. Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. The next one, I am unlovable. This is a pretty popular one again because you probably, if you feel this way, you were probably told this many times. I'm unlovable. Why would anyone love me? Look at me. I'm a wreck. I'm a mess. I don't even love me. How could I expect anyone else to love me? Psalm 136, 23. He remembered us in our lowest state. His love endures forever. If there was no one else on this earth that loved you and you don't even love you, God loves you. For God so loved the world. That's you. You are not unlovable. Two more. I just don't have any peace in my life. This kind of goes back to our verse earlier, huh? There's just no peace in my life. It feels like there's always something going on. Like the other shoe is always dropping in my life. Like it's, it's, it's one crisis after another. Sometimes, just because that's life and that season. Sometimes it's self-inflicted. But I just don't have any peace in my life. Second Thessalonians 3.16. Now may the what? The Lord of peace. What does that word Lord mean? That's not necessarily a name. It's a title. What's it mean? Master. In charge of. May the master of peace, the Lord of peace, the one who owns and can dispense peace is what that's saying. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at, there's that word again, at all times in every way the Lord be with 
you all. I love that it says at all times in every way. Just backs up and says it again. And the last one, probably the heaviest one, and I sanitized it a little bit. I'm better off gone. And you know what I mean. I'm better off gone. I'm, I'm just going to give up, turn in the keys. I don't want to do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. I'm better off gone. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those, what a good word, saves those who are crushed in spirit. What a description. Absolutely crushed, crippled in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. I don't feel like I'm loved. I feel like I should just give up. That we should be called, what? Children of God. You are God's child. You are not better off gone. You were bought with a price, Scripture says. That we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. You are not better off gone. So three reasons why we should be talking about mental health in church. Number one, it's a favorable tool of the enemy. Man, can you hear the enemy just seemingly whispering those things into your head? Telling you those things constantly. And, and sometimes it's like a broken record. Like over and over, I'm unlovable. Like, like I'm never going to get out of this. Like I, there's no peace in my life. I'm never going to find peace. I'm, I'm better off gone. And over and over and over, the enemy loves that broken record being played in our minds. But we can rise above. So number one, it's a favorable tool of the enemy. Number two... Why should we be talking about it? Because it's frequent in our society. It is frequent in our society. It is way more than you can imagine. Listen to this. More than 50% of Americans will be diagnosed with a mental illness or disorder at some point in their lifetime. More than one in every two people will have some type of a mental illness in their lifetime. Uh, here's some statistics from the Johns Hopkins website. An estimated 26% of Americans ages 18 and older, about one in four adults, suffers from a diagnosable mental disorder in one given year. One in four in one year experience a diagnosable mental disorder. Many people suffer from more than one mental disorder at a given time. In particular, depressive illnesses tend to co-occur with substance abuse and anxiety disorders. Now that's really, really big. Because what did we say about mental health? What part of your life does it affect? All of it. And if you have not one but multiple things going on with your mental health. How crippling would that be? Approximately 9.5% of American adults ages 18 and over will suffer from a depressive illness each year. Major depression, bipolar disorder, or dysythmia, persistent depressive disorder, meaning an absolute crushing, crushing depression. 9.5% of American adults. Women are nearly twice as likely to suffer from major depression than men. However, men and women are equally likely to develop bipolar disorder. While major depression can develop at any age, this is interesting, the average age at onset is the mid-20s. And we look at that now what our mid-20-somethings and even our teenagers are experiencing in life that us as adults never had to experience or go through or try to decipher, wow, it's no wonder we read that statistic. Two more. 
Most people who commit suicide have a diagnosable mental disorder, most commonly a depressive disorder or a substance abuse disorder. And the last, approximately 18% of people ages 18 through 54 have an anxiety disorder in one given year. That's a lot. It's prevalent in our culture. It's very, very, very common, frequent in our society. So we, as people, much less a church, need to know, number one, how to take care of ourselves in this, but number two, how to deal with it when we see it in a friend or a family member. Number one, it's a favorable tool of the enemy. Number two, it's frequent in our society. So here's a big question I want to answer, and we'll close. What do I want you to get from today? Because like I said, I, I have so much more to say about this. We're going to really get into it next week. But what do I want you to walk with today? What is the application? You've heard a lot about it. I've thrown a lot of information. I've thrown a lot of verses. I've thrown a lot of statistics at you. But what do I want you to walk home with today? Five things, and you can just write these down and we're done. Number one, you are not alone. You are not alone. If you are experiencing this or if you know somebody that is, you or they are not alone. We saw that. Number two, this is not your identity. Your mental health issues, whatever you're struggling with, your sin is not your identity. Number three, there is no shame. I want to back up and say that again. There is no shame in getting medical help. There is no shame in seeing a counselor. There is no shame in getting medication if that's what your doctor says you need to do. There is no shame in that. Number four, your mental health is not necessarily a result or indication of your spiritual health. Again, church people, we got to keep telling ourselves this. It is not, can, can the enemy affect it? Yes, we looked at that. But it is not necessarily a result or indication of your spiritual health. And number five, God can and will give you the strength and tools you need for victory. Does it mean you ask one time and he's going to deliver you right out of that thing? He may allow you to live with it. He may give you perfect peace through it, whatever that looks like. And I know that's kind of an oxymoron that doesn't really work out. But yes, you can have perfect peace in the midst of whatever you're struggling with. So you are not alone. This is not your identity. There is no shame in getting medical help. Your mental health is not necessarily a result or indication of your spiritual health. And God can and will give you the strength and tools you need for victory. Let's close with our key verse. Isaiah 26.3. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Let's pray. God, thank you that you promise hope. God, thank you that you promise comfort. God, thank you that you promise deliverance. Not always from our situation, but through our situation. And God, we know even in the midst of this, we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory because you are victorious. And God, you give perfect peace to those whose mind is stayed fixed on you. God, this is such a heavy subject. It is so difficult to talk about. But God, I pray that this morning as I have been praying all week long, that this would help people. That this would not only physically and mentally help them, but God, that this would draw them closer to you. 
realizing, yes, we need to see a doctor, we need to see a counselor, yes, we could take medication, but we need to fix our eyes on you, and you will walk with us through this dark valley. Thank you for deliverance, God. God, I pray for those this morning who are struggling, who, God, this is hitting home more than I could ever imagine. God, I ask that you would bring perfect peace, the peace that only you can give. God, would you bring deliverance, whatever that looks like. God, would you bring healing to those who are hurting. And God, for those who may not be struggling right now with this, God, would you help us to be encouragers, to be supporters of those around us who are struggling. God, help us never, ever to look down on someone because they are struggling with their health. But God, that we would lift them up and that we would point them to you. God, I pray for those this morning who do not have that relationship, that personal relationship with you, that they cannot honestly call you their God. God, right now in this moment, would they give their lives to you? Would they say, I'm tired of doing this on my own. I can't do it any longer. God, save me. God, change me. God, I give you my life. Be my savior. Renew my mind, Lord. Help me to look at life through the lens of your son, Jesus. God, help me to leave my old life behind and follow you. That's what you're asking for, God. You're asking for us not to say a prayer, not to have an emotion or a feeling, but to lay our lives down and follow you. That's what this life of faith is about. That's what salvation is all about. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, if you said that today for the first time, that you want to follow Jesus. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to draw any attention to you, but would you just slip your hand up so I can pray for you? Just say, I got it right today. I made a decision today to follow Jesus for the first time. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done, that you loved us enough to send your son Jesus to die for us, to make the payment for us to spend eternity with you. God, I pray for those who are deciding to follow you today for the first time. God, would they seek us out? God, would they not just let today be it, but God, would they follow through on this commitment to you? We pray for this time of offering, Lord. Thank you for the blessing that you've poured out on the church. Thank you for the generous people who have given so much in this church. But God, would you help us to use all of this to further your kingdom. God, may not a dime of it go anywhere else but to bring you glory. We pray all of this in the awesome, precious, and healing name of Jesus. Amen.